This lecture is an introduction into the chemistry of carbon. So we want to understand as biologists, what is the real difference between organic and inorganic chemistry? Here's what I mean by this. Inorganic chemistry, that's the realm of general chemistry, things like table salt, carbon dioxide, diamond, and silver, things we consider not living. Then there are compounds that we put into the category of living molecules being organic, such as DNA, table sugar, methane, and ethanol. What is the real distinction between these two? When can we start saying that something is living and something is not? Both contain carbon. So to say that organic chemistry is just based on carbon like your textbook does is a little deceptive. Carbon dioxide is carbon. Diamond is made of carbon. So is sugar. So what is the real difference? Hopefully you'll have some insight into that by the end of this lecture. So why do we care about carbon at all? Well, all life is based on carbon. Remember that carbon's unique in that it can have up to four bonds form in its outermost valence shell. The giant molecules that make up life are made primarily of carbon. Things like carbohydrates, sugars, lipids, fats, and oils, nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, and proteins that make up the structures and chemical reactions in living systems. So when we say organic chemistry, your textbook says organic chemistry is the study of carbon-based molecules. There is a little more to that, however. These molecules have some unique properties. They're very stable. They form covalent bonds. They're generally nonpolar. However, we can add things to carbon skeletons that can change their functionality and make them polar. For example, here I added a hydroxyl, an OH, and that makes it slightly polar in that region. And these are generally hydrophobic compounds. Because they're nonpolar, they are afraid of water and repulsed by it. There are no polar interactions. Now these hydrocarbons, carbons and hydrogens bonded together, can combine and grow into huge chains and molecules. And that's what makes them perfectly situated for being used in living systems. We are giant entities and we need giant molecules to make us up. Now, when reading organic molecules, you're gonna see some diagrams you're probably not familiar with. On the far left here, you can see what you probably saw in chemistry. We have sticks representing the bonds between atoms. Here's a single bond, here's a double bond. Often in organic chemistry, that is omitted. You'll see something like this ring instead. Both of these pictures convey the same exact information, just in a different way. When looking at a diagram like this ring, each corner represents a carbon atom. So instead of writing it out, it is just assumed that the corner is a carbon. The single lines represent single bonds, and the double lines represent double bonds. What's not being shown is all of those hydrogen bonds that are forming in that carbon ring. When writing out molecules in organic chemistry, if it is left blank, it is assumed that it's completely saturated with hydrogens. You only write what molecules are bonded to it if it is anything other than hydrogen. Why do we do this? Because in nature, that's how carbon molecules exist. They are always saturated by hydrogens unless something else is attached. Now, if you see a ring with the letter R attached to it, R does not represent any atom or molecule. Think of R like an X in math. It just means insert molecule here. We have this carbon ring with one thing bonded and anything could be placed in that bond. For example, here is a ring with methane, CH3, attached it could have been anything else, could have been a hydroxyl. The R is just a placeholder. So in biology, the shape matters. What you're gonna hear again and again in this class is that structure determines function. Whatever the structure is of a living thing, that's gonna dictate what it does. For example, here I have three carbon molecules. There are hydrocarbons, they're surrounded by hydrogen, and they all have different shapes. This one's in a line, this one's in a ring, this one's got a little bit protruding in the middle. These molecules we refer to as being isomers. They're molecules with the exact same molecular formula, but of completely different shapes. Each of these have six carbons surrounded by hydrogens. If I were to write the molecular formula out, it would be identical. But they, since they all come in a different shape, they're all going to do a different thing. Structure determines function. So we need to understand the variety and diversity of these isomers, how those different shapes cause different functions. One thing that can happen with isomers is you can have something called a structural isomer like you can see here. These both are C4H10, but this one's in a straight line, whereas this one, its central carbons are ordered in a different way. We have a straight line on the bottom and one protruding up. The arrangement of carbon atoms is different between these molecules, even though the molecular formula is the same. 
That is how we define a structural isomer. Same formula, just different arrangement of the carbons. You can also have a geometric isomer. So if you see these two here, they both have a carbon-carbon double bond, but what's going on on top and below is different in each of these molecules. If I were to draw an imaginary line between them and say that this is one side and this is another side, we can get some meaningful comparisons. Here you can see there's two R's on the bottom, two H's on the top. Whereas with this one, I have a HR, HR. If I have what we call a cis geometric isomer, this is where the groups are on the same side. On this side, we have two R's, and on this side, we have two H's. You can also have what's called a trans isomer. With this, we have different groups on either side. So here I have an R and an H, there an R and an H. What's defining with geometric compared to structural? Structural, the central carbons are changing, whereas with geometric, that carbon-carbon double bond remains the same. The difference in shape is just what's surrounding the carbons. And then we can also have isomers called enantiomers. An enantiomer is a mirror image of the same molecule, but we have a very similar arrangement. For example, your hands. Here with my left hand, I've got thumb on the right, four fingers. My right hand, same structure, thumb, four fingers, but the thumb here is beginning on the other side. It's a mirror image of one another. It's why I can't superimpose them. That difference is enough to change the function of a molecule. You would say that your left hand's different than your right hand. They can't overlap. That's gonna cause a difference in structure. This is why enantiomers are important. Thalidomide was a popular drug prescribed for morning sickness with pregnant women in the 50s and 60s. And here you can see a picture of one of the enantiomers. It was a success. The women who took it didn't experience any morning sickness when they were pregnant. Problem was, scientists at the time weren't aware that there was an enantiomer of this drug. You can see it right there. Didn't think much of it because it's just the mirror image, right? Doesn't really do anything. Well, not so much. Turns out that the enantiomer of formaldehyde actually caused devastating birth defects. It caused malformed limbs. So this is why it's essential as biologists that we're aware of all the different isomers because every single difference in structure can cause a difference in function. So what could you expect for your test with isomers? Would you be able to identify between these three categories? If I were to give you an isomer, could you tell me if it's structural, if it's geometric, if it's cis or trans, or if it's an enantiomer? And could you explain how each of these structures causes a difference in function? So remembering that structure determines function. Here I have a carbon ring. It's stable. It's nonpolar. It's just carbons and hydrogens. Well, if I change the structure a little bit, let's say I were to add a hydroxyl group to it, that's going to change the molecule's function. Now this ring that was once nonpolar is polar because the hydrogen group made it so. Same thing if I were to add an amine group. If I were to add an NH2, that'll actually make the molecule acidic. So it's essential that we're aware of what all these different changes are. We need to know what these molecular add-ons are, referred to as functional groups of organic chemistry, so that if we see them added to a molecule in biology, we know what difference in the function it will cause. So I'm going to go through the greatest hits of functional groups. This is just straight memorization. We will see these functional groups again and again as we go through this class. So I'm going to start with the functional group known as hydroxyl, OH, or sometimes OH minus. Compounds that have a hydroxyl are referred to as alcohols. The names typically end in all, for example, ethanol. The way it's often depicted is there'll be an R, so that's just whatever molecule it's attaching to, and the OH. The big thing to know with hydroxyls is that if I add it to a molecule, it can make it polar. It can also change the pH. If I add an OH minus to a molecule and it's removed, now I have a free-floating hydroxyl. Reminder that bases are when there's a large concentration of hydroxyls or OH minuses. The next group is called a carbonyl. It's a carbon double bonded to an oxygen with a hydrogen. It's a C double bond O. Now, a carbonyl can be added to two different parts of a molecule. If a carbonyl is added at the end of a molecule, we call it an aldehyde. If it's added into the middle of a molecule, we call it a ketone. Why these two different names? Structure determines function. 
Some aldehydes being added at the end of a molecule can behave differently than a ketone added in the middle of a molecule. And this typically is just a common isomer. We don't see dramatic changes in polarity or pH. You just want to know because sometimes you'll see the phrase aldehyde or ketone on a test. Next up is carboxyl. That's a C double bonded to an O with an OH. This bond can make things acidic. For example, here you can see acetic acid, also known as vinegar. It's at C double bond OOH that makes it a acid. Carboxyls show up. They are very common. You'll see them a lot because it's often that molecules will be made acidic or polar by adding on a carboxyl group. Next up is amino, NHH. Aminos make up amino acids which make up proteins. This is very common in our organic chemistry. An amino is just that N bound to two H's. It can pick up H pluses from solution. And this is why we say that aminos act as a base. If I add an amino group to a molecule, it's able to attach another hydrogen. It's able to go from this non-ionized form with two H's to an ionized form with three. So if I'm accepting protons, accepting hydrogens, I am basic. Sulfohydryl is next. That is a sh SH group. Sulfohydryl is just a sulfur bonded with a hydrogen. Compounds that end with SH are thiols. You won't see them that often in this class. For our purposes, the big thing you want to know about the sulfohydryl group is it stabilizes protein bonding. That's the only time we'll deal with sulfur. Proteins fold in a complex variety of ways, and it is the sulfur that helps stabilize them. So conversely, if I were to destroy sulfur in a thing, that would destroy the protein's ability to bond together. Next up, phosphate. A phosphate group is a phosphate with four oxygens. This has a slightly negative charge. You can see that in the molecular diagram here. And it's going to be used a lot when transferring energy between molecules. And we'll see it most frequently with things like DNA and RNA and a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It's a molecule that's an ion and metabolism runs on this phosphate. We will learn later how cells make energy in the form of ATP with cellular respiration. These phosphates will play a big role when it comes to that. Next up, methyl. Methyl group is a CH3. Now methyls, they're able to turn genes on and off. And that's all they really do. We won't get to this for a couple months, but if a methyl group is added, it can turn DNA off. If it's removed, it can turn DNA and those are our greatest hits of functional groups. To stress again why we care so much, any change in a molecular structure causes a change in a function. For example, here I have two sex hormones. I have estradiol, which is the female sex hormone in lions, and testosterone, the sex hormone in male lions. If you look at these two molecules, it is the slightest difference between the two. The estradiol has a hydrogen added here, whereas the testosterone only has an oxygen. And then here we have an additional methyl group. And that's it. You can have something as dramatic as differences in biological sex just with the addition of an atom or two. So there are many different functional groups. I didn't teach you all of them. We do not need to know all of them. You will take OCHEM later on in college and have a great and or horrible time. For this class, the, all you need to know are the functional groups that I just reviewed. So I started this asking you, what is the real difference between organic and inorganic chemistry? They both have carbon compounds, so what's the difference? Well, there's no clear answer. Yes, organic chemistry is primarily based in carbon, but there are carbon-based inorganic molecules too. It really does come down to its structure and function. Is this molecule something found abundantly in life that has functions that help life persist? It's probably an organic molecule. Is this something that doesn't really play any significant roles in organic things? Then it's probably inorganic. More research really is needed to draw that boundary. We still don't have a clear definition of when non-life ends and life begins. So kinds of questions you could see. You could see something like this where I present you a molecule and I ask you what functional groups are in this molecule and what do they do? That's really all we need with this. I don't want you guys to beat yourself up over learning all the functional groups. It's a memorize and move on kind of a thing. So I hope this lecture was helpful in introducing you to the functional groups, and I will see you all soon.